Well, Michael, w welcome to our discussion. Uh, this is a uh, recording between Nicholson Center in Florida and Distal Motion in Switzerland. And we wanted to talk to you about your unique robot that you have uh, been developing and kind of discuss how it fits into the robotic surgery landscape. It's a pleasure to participate in that discussion. And yeah, thanks that, and welcome as well, yeah. That's excellent. So it, it struck me when I heard the name distal motion, uh, what a perfect name that was for this industry. Um, how did you guys come to that name for the company? It was all about uh, the, the name for distal motion emerged out of a thinking process which, uh, in, in which we wanted to really understand what the essence of robotic surgery is. And, and the essence of robotic surgery, mm -hmm. the way we have understood it from out of a lot of conversations with surgeons, boils down to dexterity, precision, and surgeon ergonomics, meaning the replication of a hand movement of the surgeon into the patient. And, and that is where engineers then come up with logical things. And the logical thing here to do from a naming perspective was to call it by its name, which is a distal motion. That, that really makes sense. I think you've got a name there that's kind of going to stick with people the way intuitive has over the last couple of years where they when, when people talk about the machine, they say, well, it's intuitive. And when you talk about your, your machine, they'll say things like, well, it gives you distal motion. That's the capability that you get. So do you have a company origin story? Uh, how did this get started from, from scratch? Where did it, all of you come from? Um, what kind of capabilities did you bring to the table? So the distal motion started as a spin-off of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne in the western part of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And it was actually initiated by a PhD student uh, named Ricardo Beira, who throughout his uh, PhD on robotic surgery, tried to figure out a new way of looking at robotic surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that approach or during that research, he developed a very first two-arm robotic solution that was purely mechanical. Uh, it was a purely cable and pulley-based, mechanically actuated system that allowed the two surgeon hand movements to be replicated to instrument tips. And after that invention during his PhD, he thought, oh, that would actually be really great to make robotic surgery much more accessible and much more affordable. And, and that is how he started the company back in 2013. I then joined Distal Motion in 2014 as the lead investor of the second financing round. Uh, prior to that, I uh, built and sold another medical device uh, company and they were looking for something for, for, for fresh money and a bit of experience. And I was looking for a new challenge. And, and mm -hmm. we then invested into Distal Motion were together with Ricardo for two years, then did a buyout of Ricardo in 2016 and, and have then started scaling the company uh, two and a half years ago uh, after really having done a lot of groundwork with surgeons and nurses in clinical use to understand what value proposition we want to develop. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that you completed a cadaveric study with uh, surgeons and nurses just a few days ago, and that came out in the news. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that, how that went? Yeah, so we had uh, more than uh, 40 surgeons and nurses uh, out of uh, various European territories, uh, European key opinion leaders, join us in one of the final evaluation sessions of Dexter, which is the name of our surgical robot. The purpose of that evaluation was to really get a final confirmation that we are on the right track with uh, the device that we are developing, that it fits into laparoscopic workflows, that it can be used easily, and that it offers the same robotic and surgical capabilities as the, ob uh, the obvious um, mm -hmm. incumbent in the space, uh, uh, intuitive with their Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. And we got very good feedback out of that. And and a confirmation that uh, we should be on track to have C marking this winter and go to market in Europe next spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you have a really unique design. If you look at um, the Da Vinci and several of the machines that are coming after that, they all start with a very similar 
premise in that you build large mechanical arms and you put in a lot of electronics, a lot of computer control, and you build a big surgeon's console. And yours, it, it still kind of shows its origins as a cable driven company where you're trying to make things um, very sleek and lightweight um, and, and less intrusive at the bedside. That's, that kind of still shows as it's uh, grown and become more capable in the last few years. We have, when we started with this slow motion, uh, we have looked at robotics and we have seen that intuitive with their Da Vinci, they have their roots in remote surgery and battlefield surgery where mm -hmm. they developed a great machine for the surgeon to stay in the US and the patient to be treated somewhere internationally. And that meant the robot that they had to develop had to be able to perform the or to support the entire surgery from start to finish because the surgeon was not supposed to be in the operating room with the patient. And as a result of that, Intuitive emerged as a four to five arm solution with not only two arms for the surgeon, but also re replacing essentially the two arms of the surgical assistant. Mm -hmm. And Intuitive has found their great segment in converting surgeons from open surgery to minimally invasive surgery thanks to these robotic capabilities and, and the simplification robotics provides to, to learn MIS. We didn't want to do a me too approach because we looked at the market and we saw while intuitive with more than a million surgeries per year has obviously a very great uh, commercial case but the, the much bigger uh, volume of procedures is done laparoscopically. And we asked ourselves, how can we bring those really true benefits of robotic surgery, the dexterity, the surgeon ergonomics and the stable image into those laparoscopic workflows? So how can we augment, how can we augment laparoscopy with robotics instead of replacing laparoscopy with a fully robotic workflow? And, and that, is, that is the inspiration we had for, for the, the guiding principle we have with, with Dexter, mm -hmm. which then also means that it ended up in a device that has two arms because the surgeon has two hands and it fits into these surgical workflows, into, the, into these laparoscopic workflows where the assistant is still present. The assistant mm -hmm. still has its, his or her function and job in, in a laparoscopic workflow. And, um, and we just augment and provide robotics for those parts of the procedure where robotics provides true value. And, and these are based on a lot of discussions with surgeons, two tasks in the procedure. It's dissection and suturing. That is where you need dexterity. Those are the parts of the procedure that take a lot of time. Hence, you need the ergonomic working position. And those are also the parts of the procedure where a stable image help adds a lot to the comfort and uh, of of this uh, for the surgeon mm -hmm. and and so we said let's focus on these true benefits on these true value add phases in the surgery with the robotic augmentation and allow the surgeon to continue using their advanced laparoscopic image uh, advanced laparoscopic instruments for the specialized tasks such as stapling or vessel sealing or going in with a clip applier because those are tasks that are very short so you don't care about ergonomics those are tasks that re uh, really need very advanced and super well validated instruments that the major players out there the covidians and ethicons of the world have developed and uh, and surgeons trust those brands mm -hmm. uh, and and so people yeah. should just continue using that same for imaging there is great imaging technologies out there from the Olympus and strikers of the world. Why should we as a robotics company try to develop our own imaging system? We will never be even close to the level of what these players have. Plus, and then I'm concluding my, my little speech. We have, um, when, you, when you lock everything into, a, into one system, the way Intuitive does it, what happens if there is new innovation in imaging but from, a, from a, another player? Mm -hmm. If we force people to use one robot which has all the functions in that robot, those customers, those surgeons have no way to access a new imaging modality. Mm -hmm. um, they need to wait until the robotics company has integrated or licensed that technology 
into their system and, and that just doesn't allow surgeons and patients to get access to the best tool for each step in the surgical workflow. Right. And we firmly believe that by focusing, we, we can allow surgeons and patients to get access to the best tool at each stage. I, th I think you made a great point there. With, with the explosion in the robots that are following the intuitive model, companies like Olympus and Sony and others who make imaging systems are, are working to figure out how to get their latest product integrated with or part of uh, those robotic systems and wondering how long that'll take to get it uh, from being its own standalone system to being part of the robot. Whereas with your system, um, once it's standalone and available, they are, it's an option that, that the surgeon can choose to use right then if they want to. Exactly, exactly. And by going into that modular approach, by focusing on the two arms, it, it also makes your system much more affordable. Uh, we, and, and I think that addresses a second really big adoption barrier that robotic surgery still faces today. Um, we focus on the two arms for the left and right hand of the surgeon and can provide that then at a you know, three to four times a lower price point than, than traditional robotic approaches, which then all of a sudden make robotic surgery really accessible for a very wide range of procedures and, and also uh, clinic setups and, and territories. Right, right. You know, I was going to get to cost a little bit later, but since you bring it up now, there's two components to cost from the perspective of the hospital. The first is the capital investment, where they have to decide how much they can spend on uh, one or two or three platforms. I mean, certainly if you're going to get into robotics in a big way and commit to one um, device particularly, you'll probably buy more than one. So you've got a budget for the capital purchase. And then of course there's the uh, per surgery price if you're talking about disposable instruments. Um, and you just explained how the capital uh, model changes with distal motion. How about the per surgery and disposable costs? What, what is distal motion plan there? With Dexter, we, we also offer a very new uh, business model compared to traditional robotic approaches. With Dexter, you don't have a capital equipment cost. We have, uh, and that is part of the innovation we, that supports our, our uh, company. We have been able to develop single use instruments that are, uh, that provide the full robotic dexterity and the full robotic capabilities and make them at such a low uh, cost that we can then go into a pay-per-use business model where we place the robotic hardware, the Dexter system into the hospitals. We offer maintenance and servicing. We, we offer the training and surgeons and hospitals then only pay per surgery. Uh, and so that, that shortens, drastically shortens the sales cycles and, and takes out the, the conversation around CapEx and, and hospital budgets and these types of things. So you mentioned that uh, the cost is per surgery and that's per surgery rather than per instrument. So you're presuming that they would use two, three or four instruments per surgery and then you build your model around that? Yes, we, so, so we offer those procedure packs and in those procedure packs you have uh, three instruments plus the drapes and all the, all the consumables. Okay. And if you need more, more than those three instruments that come in at the very marginal uh, rate so that you know it doesn't really blow up your your uh, cost for the procedure okay that's great okay so one of the questions that i was going to talk about pe people will see when, when people look at a picture of the dexter system and read some of your materials they'll see that your model is for the surgeon to be able to do those long pieces that you described of suturing and cutting while sitting or standing ergonomically at the robotic controls, but that they can turn around and walk straight to the bedside and do some of the, the shorter things like maybe uh, using some energy or doing stapling, um, those kinds of things. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that model of switching back and forth between being a robot user and then being a bedside surgeon? Yeah. We target laparoscopic setups. We target surgeons that have a, a certain laparoscopic experience and, and those surgeons, they want to be, remain surgeons. They want to remain close to the patient. And so the design 
of Dexter needs, needs to allow those surgeons to switch easily between what we call a laparoscopy mode, uh, where they are standing at the table, performing the tasks the way they're used to doing it mm -hmm. in their current practice, and then the robot augmented mode of the procedure where the surgeon goes to the, to the console, to the surgeon console, to perform the robotic parts of the procedure. That switching is enabled by the fact that the surgeon console can be operated while being scrubbed in, while being sterile. And so, so the way you would need to imagine that transition, which takes about 20 seconds from robotics to laparoscopy and from laparoscopy to robotics, and we have confirmed that as one of the endpoints in the cadaver study this summer, uh, the, 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 wor the workflow is to, you remove the laparoscopic instruments you, uh, from the trocars, you plug in the robotic instruments through the same trocars that you mm -hmm. previously used for laparoscopy. It's, by the way, off-the-shelf trocars. We don't need to have our own proprietary trocar designs, which also makes it okay. easier for hospitals to, to adopt Dexter as part of their framework purchasing agreements with the trocar suppliers. So they dock it into the same trocars, which is as quickly as inserting a laparoscopic instrument they do the two steps to the surgeon console, sit down or, or just assume the working position in standing mode, grab the handles. And as soon as they've grabbed the handles, the instruments start to mimic the movements of the handle, much like they are used to from other robotic platforms. Okay. And our, our listeners are familiar with the, the laparoscopic fulcrum effect of uh, reversing the movement of instruments when you're going in. I just want to clarify that when the surgeon switches from bedside to robotic control, that they're, they have the same fulcrum effect in both environments. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Uh, we, uh, we offer the same uh, perfect replication that surgeons are used to from robotics platforms. In robotic uh, platforms, when the, the handle moves yep. a bit to the left, the instrument moves in the same direction at the same velocity. In, it does the same movement. So it's a perfect replication from the outside to the inside, much like surgeons expect it from a robotics platform. We have actually, it's a very important question that you ask, and can the brains of the surgeons, can they adapt between a mode where they are uh, operating manually with a fulcrum effect Mm -hmm. and the robotics mode where irrespectively of the penetration depth they have a perfect replication of the movement and the clear answer is yes and, and there's a reason for that yes the reason is that the tasks that they need to do laparoscopically they are again you go in with a stapler meaning you position it mm -hmm. and then you fire it but there is no complex movements you need to do inside the patient like right. the ones you need for for, for suturing or for right. dissection. And so that complexity with the fulcrum effect and, and the scaling, depending on how deep you are in the patient, that, that can be really ignored when you just go in with a tool, apply it, fire it, and go out again. Okay. And then, so that switching doesn't really, uh, it, it didn't turn out to be even something that people know that we have had zero comments from the surgeons on that. Okay. So I wanted to ask about uh, 3D vision for the surgeon. Now, I understand you're using an Olympus camera or some other vendor's camera. And so you could choose to be using one of the 3D cameras, the stereoscopic cameras, or you could choose to use the, a, a traditional 2D camera. And the surgeon, when they're standing at the bedside, would be looking at the monitors around the table as they would any traditional laparoscopic procedure. And then when they turn to the Dexter controls, they could have a 3D image there, or they could have a 2D. Is that correct? They just up to what, whatever the OR wants to configure it. With Dexter, we want to give surgeons really the choice of what tools they use for each aspect of the surgery. And one of those choices is the imaging platform. And some surgeons, they like to use 3D. They have 3D scopes in the OR, so they can continue using those 3D scopes with uh, Dexter. Other uh, surgeons prefer a good 4K system. So they, they purchase a 4K system and use it together with, uh, with Dexter. We really give surgeons the freedom to, to choose and use those tools that are best suited for their needs. 
Mm-hmm. And that is a very unique approach as well in, 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 robotics, in the robotics world today. Right. I can see that flexibility. It, it goes all back to what you said about just providing the two hands and making it an open system where um, the, the local surgeon or the local OR team can configure this, the whole uh, environment the way they want it, depending on what kind of camera they want, what kind of stapler they want. All that is, is, is flexible for them. We go in, with Dexter, we go into existing surgical setups. They have standard operating procedures for their laparoscopic workflows. They have their proven validated tools that the surgeons and, and whole, um, surgical teams use. We don't want to change them. It is, there's no clinical need to change any of that. We just come in with a lean product with a small footprint that fits into those workflows. And that just gives them another option, another treatment tool uh, at their disposition indeed. Mm -hmm. So when when a hospital or an OR team is asking uh, about bringing your system in to their OR, they're they're going to be interested in things like the footprint of the equipment that comes in or the weight of the the equipment that they're going to be moving around. What can you say to characterize its size and its weight and its place around the operating table? As part of the design of Dexter, we have been very carefully looking at uh, making a design that really fits into the widest range possible of operating rooms. So footprint and weight are obviously important parameters we know from other robotic solutions that are rather heavy, that this sometimes places uh, is a constraint for for the hospital, uh, just uh, construction, the floor. We don't have that limitation. It's sufficiently light that you can consider that you can treat it much like a, an endoscope tower or a surgical table. It's, it's not heavier than that. And also from a footprint perspective, we've really taken a lot of care to make sure it is not a massive platform that prevents you from using other equipment in parallel to, to, to Dexter. It, it really integrates nicely. And that was, is also something we have confirmed now this summer with the real device in, in the cadaver lab. Mm -hmm. So on your website, there are a number of pictures and animations showing the device and how it works. We haven't seen yet um, essentially a full video of somebody using the device. Do do you know when that kind of detail about the device would be publicly available? We we will start to publish that uh, once we have done the summative evaluation, which will be early uh, next year. but nevertheless, anyone who would want to see the device, him or herself, is really invited to come and, and, and play with it and, and have a hands-on experience on Dexter. I, I'm sure most people would love to come to the Luzon area to, to see the robot and maybe do a little skiing while they're there. Yeah, it's yeah. a nice place. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're a Swiss company, and what's it like to be developing this in a country that's very well known for its expertise in developing medical devices, electronics, and all the, the technologies that kind of surround what you're creating. It, it, ha- it being Swiss is very important for, for distal motion on, on many levels and it has a lot of advantages. The first one, I guess, is access to talent within very close proximity. We have a really broad range of engineering, regulatory, but also marketing and sales expertise. Just anecdotally, Intuitive has their international headquarters five miles from our office. So mm. it's uh, also for medical devices a really, a really good place where we're at. Um, so to access to talent is very important. And I guess um, the second really important aspect is the contract manufacturers that are around us, the, the suppliers, the specialized suppliers, from the metal injection molding company to uh, the sterilization um, uh, pathways or com- providers to those companies who can manufacture and source and assemble complex devices such as Dexter. Nevertheless, we have more than 15,000 individual parts in Dexter. So there's a lot of engineering complexity hidden below its uh, cover. Mm-hmm. And that we can source uh, all in, in within within two hours of of, uh, of where we are uh, located, which obviously makes it makes the whole design transfer and sourcing and supply chain handling um, quite easy. Mm-hmm. And the third one, which is probably the most important one and and the the, the most 
the least obvious one maybe is, and we come back to price, we are substantially less expensive than any other robotic solution out there, even when we look at the new entrance into the space. But the fact that we are so less expensive is not because we manufacture in, in areas of low labor costs. Switzerland is probably one of the places that are the most expensive to manufacture. But we, we are so, less, so much less expensive because of the, the novel approach, the new concepts behind Dexter. And being able to call Dexter Swiss made allows us, when we go out to talk to customers, to have their trust that it is a quality product, that it is not a cheap solution. And that helps us tremendously that we can go out and say, hey, it's super affordable, but it's Swiss made. So you can, you can trust the safety of your, your patients to, you know, you, you can rely on that uh, uh, trust right. when, when you use, use it on patients. Right, that, sound, that does sound good. So you had a really interesting origin story with the work of a PhD student. And I imagine in the development process as you um, matured that design and brought it to where it is today, that there have been some really interesting um, engineering challenges that you've overcome. And I was wondering if there's any one of those stories that you'd like to share with everybody. When you develop a new product for an existing market, the first and biggest challenge is that you don't just copy the concept that everyone else has, uh, that you try to find a really new and very relevant value proposition. So the first really challenge we had, and that was the first four years that we we're bit busy with that is to figure out what robotic surgery needs to look like for it to become standard of care and not to be locked into the niche that it still is today. And, and that is probably the first really important challenge that you make a device that fulfills those needs and that is super simple to use uh, and, and for, for all stakeholders in the workflow, including also the nurses. It should be as easy as a drill and I think we, we're not far away from that. Um, from a, a very technical perspective, then the the biggest challenge was to make those instruments disposable and, and highly affordable, and that is where a lot of our IP goes in into the um, the mix uh, to make a, a single use instrument that provide. And again, uh, we are grateful for their existence that provide Da Vinci equivalent dexterity and precision yet is at the price point so that you can use it in, in all medium to high complexity cases in, in all territories that do laparoscopy. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us and to share what details you're able to share this early in the process. I know there are a lot of people looking forward to seeing this very unique machine um, and, and no, learning more about it. Uh, maybe they're booking plane tickets to Lausanne right now uh, since you've opened invitation for them to come and use it. But I, I appreciate your talking with us. It was a pleasure for, for us to be part of your important platform. Thank you very much. Thank you.